So we've already been looking quite a lot at AI and uh, I would just like to thank the two speakers from today and yesterday for really setting the context for what I want to, to talk about. I think this has been extremely helpful and there will be little bits of overlap, places where I can move on more quickly because of what has already been, been covered. So what I want to focus on specifically is on how this might relate to human uniqueness and how we should think about ourselves in light of some of these discussions and debates about artificial intelligence. Well, what is artificial intelligence? Well, we've already heard a, a full talk about this uh, yesterday, but here's one definition given by uh, one of the founding fathers, if you like, of the, the, the subject who was present at a, a foundational meeting um, in the States back in the 1950s, John McCarthy, who described AI as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. And AI involves work in a, a whole range of areas, some of which I've list, listed on the screen here, uh, machine learning, search, knowledge, and, and reasoning. Um, uncertainty as well. So that's one of the areas that I, I do some work on myself in the area of uncertainty using probability theory, but also in terms of knowledge and reasoning. Now machine learning, as we heard yesterday, is, is really a subset of AI, but actually machine learning has become so powerful over the, the last 10 or 15 years that uh, it's often used interchangeably with artificial intelligence because a lot of the new developments in AI are the result of developments in machine learning. And that has come about for a variety of reasons, including um, we often hear the phrase big data, the, the massive amounts of data that are available in, in science, but also from the internet and social media and so forth. Uh, so we, we have big data, we also have the, the powerful modern computers that we have, as well as some developments in the algorithms. And for all of these reasons, uh, machine learning has become the driving force of a lot of AI. But my focus today is, is to focus on some particular questions. And as you've heard this morning already, there's loads of questions uh, of a, a social, legal, ethical nature about AI and how we, how we think about those questions for society and the development of these technologies within society. But how we approach those questions, I think also, uh, depends to some extent on how we think about these underlying questions about what it means to be human and whether AI might raise some questions about that. So I want to focus on, on two big questions. First of all, are humans just complex computing machines? And secondly, are humans purely physical? So that's where I'm going in the talk. Uh, at the end, I will then look at how some of these questions relate more directly to a, a Christian worldview. But most of my talk will be just looking at, at these questions without bringing a, a Christian worldview directly to bear on, on the issues, but then thinking about how it might relate to such a worldview at the end. So there are some big questions. There are also some big answers to these questions. So we have the cognitive psychologist, Stephen Pinker, who says that thinking is computation, the mind is a neural computer. So I'm not sure if that's how you think about yourself, but that's what you are, that's what your mind is, a neural computer, according to Pinker. But others disagree. The philosopher John Searle says that the programmed computer understands what the car and the adding machine understand, namely, exactly nothing. So quite a divergence of opinion. So who is right about this? And so really what I want to look at is, is artificial intelligence possible? Um, because if it is, then that might raise a question. If, if really uh, AI is possible and it can do just the sort of things that we can do, does that suggest that maybe we are just computer programs ourselves? Well, we've already heard about some of these examples yesterday, but I, I just want to recap on them briefly. Uh, if we go back over 20 years now to IBM's Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, um, 
This caused quite a bit of concern at the time and in the newspaper and media reports about this, people were concerned. After all, chess, this was something that was meant to be a uniquely human ability requiring human reason and logic and surely something we couldn't be beaten by, by machines. Um, Kasparov himself was, was quite depressed about this at the time as well. But IBM, uh, the, the developers said that this wasn't really um, uh, a full version of, of AI. What they were doing was using knowledge from games that had been played by humans. They were using strategic thinking, using the power of the computer to be able to look many moves ahead. So it was really the brute force computations of the computer, arguably, that were doing a lot of the work. And so Kasparov said that uh, the Deep Blue, I, I think the way he put it was something like that it had um, no more intelligence in the programmable alarm clock was how he, he phrased it. But then he went on to say that not, not that being beaten by a $10 million programmable alarm clock didn't make me feel much better about losing to it. So it, it didn't really help. But if we move forward to 2011, uh, another IBM system, Watson winning a quiz show in the United States. And here it's uh, dealing with, with general knowledge. And so it was able to process language. It, it would. Actually, the way it worked was the contestants are given a que uh, an answer and they had to come up with the question. Now, this was a, a, a challenge because it was able to process natural language um, to some extent. And throughout the history of AI, this has been an enormous challenge, actually, to be able to deal with, with natural language. And uh, it's one of the main areas of research in AI. And, and so a lot of progress has been made in this area over the last 10 years or so. So this was quite a significant achievement. Intelligence, well, again, in this case, the system had access to all of Wikipedia. Uh, and you might think, well, if you've got access to all of that and you can process it with the power of modern computers, um, is that really intelligent? Or again, is it just the power of computation? But let's now come forward further to 2017 with AlphaGo. Um, AlphaGo Zero beating the World Go champion. Now this was quite different, I think, in terms of how it went about it. Go is the Chinese version of chess, and it's much more complex than chess. Just by the, the number of possible moves, it's much, much greater. And so the sort of strategies that were used back in 1997 by Deep Blue would not have worked in the case of Go. How did it work? Well, it wasn't by putting in human strategies and letting the machine work with those, but rather just giving it the rules of the game. That's all they did. They give it the rules of the game and then let it learn from its own experience using what's called reinforcement learning. So it would play games against itself and would over time improve its performance. And of course, because it was a computer, it could do this much more quickly than humans. Uh, and so it would learn from its experience up to a level where it was able to, to beat the world champion. Now, even the way I describe that, learning from experience, this is beginning to sound like something uh, more more like humans, more like a human ability. Nevertheless, we might still ask the question whether these systems are, are really intelligent. And just before we do that, I, I want to draw uh, attention to a distinction that, that Jeremy also mentioned earlier this morning about a, a difference between what we might call weak AI and strong AI. So in the former case, Computers are used as a tool for studying the mind, or we might think of them as simulating the mind, just as we use computers for simulating all sorts of things. Simulating the weather, for example, we could use them to simulate minds and simulate human behavior. So this would be weak AI, whereas strong AI is, is the idea that the, appro the appropriately programmed computer really is a mind. We're trying to develop not just something that simulates intelligent, but that is intelligent. Um, that is a mind. So it's really strong AI that is my focus. Is strong AI possible? Well, one way of thinking about this question takes us to the Turing test. So Alan Turing, uh, who of course is, is well known for his, his work in mathematics and computer science and of course perhaps more famously for his 
uh, code breaking work um, during World War II. He wrote a paper about this in, in 1950 where he set out to address the question as to whether a computer can think. But he proposed to um, approach this by means of a, a, a different type of question. Rather than addressing this kind of philosophical question, it was rather to propose a test, which has become known as the Turing test. And it's a very simple one. You're probably familiar with it. The idea is that we have a, a human in one room, um, a computer system in another, and we have a human interrogator in a third room, separated off from the other human and the computer system. The interrogator's goal is to determine which is the, the human and which is the computer by means of asking questions. So this test has come in for a lot of criticisms uh, amongst computer scientists uh, and others as well. Um, some will defend it, many others will criticize it, but is it a good test for intelligence. If a system passed this test, would it be right to say that it was intelligent? Well, not according to John Searle, an American philosopher who way back in 1980, and these things tend to go in cycles in AI. There are some new developments and it improves dramatically and there's a lot of debate and discussion about it. Then it sort of dies off for a period of time and then it takes off again and we, we have the same debates coming up. So Searle proposed what's known as the Chinese room argument as an argument against the idea of strong AI. And here's the idea. And again, it's a simple one. So you have uh, a person in a room with a rule book. As input coming in from the left side of the room, we have symbols in the form of Chinese characters. Um, Apologies if you're a Chinese speaker. Uh, these are not Chinese characters, but uh, for illustrative purposes, hopefully you get the idea. So we have Chinese characters coming in. We have this manual that the person uh, uses in the room, and the manual says on the basis of the symbols coming in, then you should output other symbols at the other side of the room, again in the form of Chinese characters. And it turns out that the input consists of questions in Chinese, the, the input, that is, and the output consists of the corresponding answers in Chinese. Now, it's important, I think, to say that Searle's idea was that the, the person in the room is doing what a computer does, processing instructions, okay? Following certain instructions, taking input, giving output. Now, actually, the, the picture as to what computers do uh, and modern computers, there's an awful lot more going on. Nevertheless, at its heart, um, this is his idea. And it's interesting that when you go back to the original idea of a computer, the original computers were actually human beings. Okay? It was when we had... Uh, typically mathematicians who were working on problems and there was a lot of tedious mathematics to do and they didn't have time to do it, they would employ human computers who were not brilliant mathematicians but they would be able to follow just the logical simple steps in a routine manner to help get the right answers. And so the, uh, this model of a, a person doing the processing is perhaps not as ridiculous as it seems. Now notice that in terms of meaningful questions, meaningful answers, this system would pass the Turing test. And not only would it pass the Turing test, it would pass the Turing test in Chinese. So if any system is intelligent, surely this one is. But according to Searle, there's a, a fly in the ointment, and that is that Searle says, I am the man in the room, and I don't understand a single word of Chinese. So here we have a system that could pass the Turing test in Chinese, and yet there is no understanding. All we have is the, the blind processing of information. Now, it's safe to say this is a controversial argument. It is the most controversial argument, I, I would say, in terms of debates about AI, and many people reject Searle's argument for a variety of reasons. Let me mention just a couple of objections. One is what's called the systems reply. 
And this is the idea that understanding isn't at the level of just the, the person in the room. It's at the level of the whole system. We can't replace the, it's not the, the person who is a computer, it's the whole system that represents the computer. So maybe the man doesn't understand, but maybe the system as a whole has understanding. And Searle's response is pretty dismissive to this, as you might imagine. He says, well, if the man can't understand Chinese, there's no reason to think that the man plus the pieces of paper and the walls of the room and so forth have any understanding either. So, so far, I think so good. Let's move on to uh, another objection, and this is called the robot reply. And this says that if the, the room were connected up to a robot that could interact with the world, now this would be a bit more like a, a human being, isn't it? By interacting with the world that we learn, that we gain concepts and so forth. And so perhaps if it was connected up, if this Chinese room, were to be connected up to a robot and then could act intelligently in the world, then it would have understanding. And Searle's response is just to say, well, this would just mean far more complex input and far more complex output to control the body of the robot, but we still would have no understanding. It doesn't really change the picture. Now, a particular way of thinking about this, and central, I think, to Searle's argument, is that you can't get semantics from syntax. That what a computer does, he would have said, is it processes syntax, the mere formal rules of, of logic and language. But you can't just get from all of that formal stuff to semantics, to the actual understanding and meaning. So for Searle, there's a very close link between understanding and intelligence on the one hand and consciousness as well. Okay? So to have intelligence or understanding for Searle requires a conscious agent. But many people disagree with him about this. They will say, uh, well, no understanding or intelligence doesn't require consciousness. Consciousness is important. But this is not necessary for intelligence. And if the system can act in an intelligent way, perhaps that's enough. So Daniel Dennett says that Searle has apparently confused a claim about the underivability of semantics from syntax with a claim about the underivability of the consciousness of semantics from syntax. But I think there's a simple improvement that we can make to Searle's argument. And so my claim is that this Chinese room argument would be much more persuasive if we considered it as an argument against computer systems being conscious. Because then there's not really so much debate. It's not a matter of definition. If you think about conscious experience, there's a subjective feel as to what it's like to be in pain, for example. So let's think about what the argument might look like. And I'll focus on a particular conscious experience, that of emotion. So let's reframe the question, could a computer have emotion? So we run through the um, Chinese room scenario again, but now the questions are about emotions. So the input consists of Chinese characters giving questions about emotions, perhaps how the system feels or something like that, and it communicates perfectly well discussing its emotions. So the question then is, well, it could pass a Turing test for emotion. Would it really have emotion? Well, I think the answer is, is no, because there's no reason whatsoever to think that this system would have any conscious emotional experience. It would be able to do all the processing. It would be able to give answers as if it had emotions. But there's no reason at all to think that it has the experience of emotion, the emotion of anger, let's suppose. What about the robot reply? Let's suppose now that we had the system connected up to the body of a robot. And now we have emotional input and all these signals are sent to the Chinese room. The man in the room does all the processing. Horrendously complicated, of course, but this is only a thought experiment. The output controls the body of the robot, and the robot acts as if it had emotions. Now, just as an aside here, of course, and, and we've already heard about this, there is a lot of work going on in AI in terms of the emotions, of, of detecting emotions and acting as if it had emotions. 
But is it doing more than acting as if it had emotion? So here I'm just granting that all of that is possible, whether and to what extent it's possible is another matter. But let's suppose it can do it perfectly. It acts as if it had emotions. Well, would it have emotion? Well, let's suppose that you're interacting with this robot and you get angry with it for some reason. Um, I don't know, maybe it has done something to you or taken something from you and you get angry with it, just as you would with another human being. And the robot responds just as another human being would. Uh, perhaps it gets angry in response or maybe it's been programmed as a Christian robot and gives you a nice <laughs> gentle response, I'm not sure. But, but anyway, let's suppose that it, it gets angry in response. But is it really angry? Well, I would suggest that it's not because the person in the room has no emotional experience of anger. He doesn't know what's going on. He's just processing all the information in the room. And if he doesn't have that experience of anger, I think there's no reason to think that the robot has experience of anger either. Let's consider another related objection to strong AI, and this is what I call the programmer's objection to AI. And the basic idea is that computer programmers typically know how computer programming works. Well, some know better than others, but the general idea in computer programming Grossly oversimplifying, of course, but we get input, we are able to do processing, we write computer programs to do all of that, and we get output. Now, this processing bit in the middle can be very sophisticated, and with modern AI, what we're able to do in terms of input and output turns out to be much more sophisticated than maybe we thought was feasible in the past. Nevertheless, in terms of the algorithms we use, even the best modern algorithms in AI, we know how to use these, at least in general terms, to get a certain, from a certain type of input to a certain type of output. So we can explain how to get the behavior. We can explain the functioning of the program. We know how the program functions, and so we can explain it at a functional level. So we can explain how to get the behavior. But what we can't do, I think, on the basis of our knowledge of how programs work, is we can't explain how to get emotion. So you go to the best software engineers in the world, and you ask them to develop a system that will act as if it had emotions. And, and they think, well, this is challenging, but we can use modern tools and AI to do the processing, and we'll develop a system for you that will hopefully act as if it had emotion. But if you say, I, but I want more than that, I would like you to develop a system for me that not only acts as if it had emotions, but really does have them. Well, I think any sensible software engineer will look at you and say, I have no idea how to do that. Um, that that's just not what I can do with a computer program. I can only do things at a functional level. And so what I'm suggesting here is that there's this explanatory gap between what we can explain in terms of the functioning of the program and emotion. So, so far, is AI possible? Weak AI? Maybe we could discuss that, or to what extent it's possible. Strong AI? Well, I've given two arguments for thinking that we can't. The Chinese room with the emotions and this programmer's objection. So, are humans just computer programs? I hope you will be pleased that the answer I'm arriving at is no. There's something fundamentally different between humans and computer programs. But what about the second question, are humans purely physical? And so that's what I want to, to turn to now. There are all sorts of physical objects in the world. Um, this table up at the front is something that we could measure its length, we could weigh it, uh, and, and so forth. So, it has these physical properties. So there are all these physical objects in the world, whether it's desks or um, trees or mountains or whatever, all sorts of physical things in the world, but there are also mental things in the world. There are thoughts, feelings. Um, you might imagine the, the thought that uh, I'd, I'd really love something to eat for lunch now. Um, and, and that's, that's a, there's a feeling that you have, that you're, you're feeling a bit hungry. Now, when we think about that thought or feeling, that's not something that has these physical properties. It's not something we can weigh. 
It doesn't have a particular shape or, or size. It, it just seems to be a very different kind of, of entity. Furthermore, the physical aspects of the world can be described by physics and chemistry, whereas your thought about wanting lunch can't be described in that way. And furthermore, physical things can't be experienced directly. I mean, if I want to experience this table, I have to look at it or touch it or, or whatever. I have to detect it in some way. But the thought I'm feeling hungry is something that I, I don't have to measure that or observe it or detect it. I, I just know that I feel, feel hungry. And I know that I feel hungry in a way that you don't. Okay, maybe you can guess from my behavior or something, but I'm, I have access to that in a way that you don't. So my basic point here is that, at least at face value, there seems to be a huge difference between the physical and the mental. And so when we come to think about this, then philosophers have really described a number of different views, um, and I'm not doing justice to them because there's many more that we might have included in this screen. But I think broadly speaking, we can divide them between physicalism and dualism. Physicalism basically says that um, everything is ultimately physical. So your mind is ultimately to be understood solely in physical terms. Um, and dualism says that's not the case. There's something beyond, something over and above the physical. So to take physicalism, there's a, a range of different flavors of physicalism. Um, we can take eliminativism or eliminative materialism, which is what it's short for at the bottom. And this basically says, well, all this idea about consciousness and mental um, states and so forth, these aren't real, or at least that's one version of it. Um, they're, they're not real, ultimately it's just the physical stuff that is real. Or perhaps more realistically, what some people will say in this category is, well, these things like consciousness and beliefs and desires and so forth, these are okay for sort of common sense usage, but once we have a proper scientific understanding of the world, we won't need these sort of human concepts anymore. They will give way to a scientific account. Or we might have a reductive physicalism that's not denying their existence or importance, but saying that they can be explained in terms of the lower level physics and chemistry. Or we might have a non-reductive physicalism. And the non-reductive physicalism is, is much more sophisticated, I think. And it will say that we can't explain um, our thoughts and so forth and um, our conscious experiences in terms of physical. But nevertheless, it's... What's going on physically that, 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 that's really all that's going on? This causes and realizes what's going on in terms of, of consciousness. Dualists, however, take a different view on this. And they fall into, into two categories, broadly speaking. Um, one is what we might call property dualism. And it will say there's more than just the physical. Um, but there's not an extra thing, okay? Substance dualism will say there is an extra thing, what we might traditionally call the soul, okay? So in addition to your physical body, you have a soul. That would be the sort of idea of substance dualism. But property dualism says, well, no, there's no soul. In terms of the things that there are, there's just the physical stuff of the universe and your body and brain and so forth. But your brain has these properties that are non-physical. And that's where consciousness and the mental come into the picture. It has these mental properties. So there's still something non-physical about your existence. Now, just to relate a little bit to what Jeremy was talking about this morning, and emergentism would be another view that we could bring in here. And I, I think basically how we think about emergentism, uh, we could think of a weak emergentism, which is basically still that everything is going on at the physical level. There is nothing beyond the physical. It would really be a sort of non-reductive physicalism, 
Whereas a, a strong emergentism would say, no, the physical gives rise to something over and above the physical itself. And we might think of that sort of strong emergentism as being a type of dualism. Now, again, as we heard this morning, there are many Christians, and this came as a surprise to me when I started looking into this area, that there are many Christian physicalists. And I was baffled at this. I thought a physicalist is somebody who believes only in the physical universe. Surely Christians believe in the supernatural. But what, what we mean by Christian physicalist is that when it comes to the human mind, we are just physical entities. Okay? There is no non-physical dimension to us. Now, I'm going to argue against physicalism. So let me put it like this, that I think there's an explanatory gap here. Um, and these are, are not my own ideas. These are the views of various philosophers who have argued in this area. But when we try to explain the world in physical terms, we can explain quite a lot, of course, but there's always a gap between the physical and the mental. So if we try to explain things at the level of neurons uh, and the, the physical processing that's going on in the brain, there's always going to be a gap between that and, for example, the conscious experience of pain. Now, some people would say, ah, but, but hold on a second. Let's take an analogy here. Let's think of water. So the water that's in this cup consists of molecules of H2O. Now, none of those molecules is wet. It's not a property of a molecule to be wet. It's just a molecule that has various physical properties, but it's not wet. Wetness only comes in when you have loads and loads of these molecules, as I have in this cup. And so wetness, or liquidity, is this higher order property of the physical system. So the suggestion is, well, maybe it works the same way for neurons and pain. Maybe pain is just this higher order physical property. There's nothing more to it than that. Well, I think for a variety of reasons, that doesn't seem convincing to me. Um, but the question is whether science could provide an explanation of this in the future, and so we might turn to neuroscience. Well, here what I would say is that whilst there's a lot of progress that's been made, and this is obviously a very important area for looking at how brain behavior is associated with pain and causes pain, that's a different thing from saying that there's just nothing more to, the, to our experience of pain than the physical processing of the neurons. So I would suggest that no matter how sophisticated our science gets, it won't be able to explain what it feels like to be in pain. There will always be this gap. Now, what about this difference between water? Well, if you think about it, um, really, it's impossible to imagine a world, I think, where we have a cup with all these molecules of H2O in exactly the same physical condition, and yet there is no wetness or no liquid. That just doesn't make sense. The, once you have all the molecules, a large collection of water molecules, the wetness just sort of comes along for free. It's not something extra that you need to do. But it's certainly possible to imagine a physical system that's constructed just as we are, and yet doesn't have the subjective experience of feeling pain, for example. There's something that's being left out. Well, David Chalmers, who um, is one of the, the world's leading philosophers in this area, he's an atheist, so there's no ax to grind on, on that sort of issue. And he defends this explanatory gap. He says that physical accounts explain at most structure and function Whereas explaining structure and function is insufficient for explaining consciousness. This conscious experience of pain is something that goes beyond structure and function. And if that's right, then no physical account can explain consciousness. So it's not just a matter of developing our science a little bit further, um, getting some more 
knowledge of the brain, a physical understanding will only yield structure and function, and that is inadequate. Let's turn to another popular argument about this, what's called the knowledge argument. So the idea here is that Mary is the world's leading scientist of color vision. She knows everything there is to know about color vision. So she knows about the wavelength of various colors of light. Red light, for example, she will be able to tell you about the wavelength. She will also be able to tell you about all the physical processes that go on when that light impacts on the retina of the eye and is picked up by the photoreceptor cells and the signals are sent uh, along the optic nerve and so forth. All the details of the, the brain science and you can tell I'm quickly running out of my depth here because I don't know those details, but Mary does. She knows all of them in great detail. In fact, there's nothing about the science of color vision that Mary does not know. However, Mary is colorblind. She has never seen a red rose in her life. She has never experienced the redness of seeing a rose. Everything she sees, it's a very unusual form of color blindness, we'll assume, where she sees everything in either black or white or shades of gray. That's all she has ever seen in her life. But of course, she could look at your brain and looking at all that's going on, she could predict whether you are experiencing seeing red, for example. But she has never seen the color red herself. But then one day a, a cure is developed and Mary's um, color blindness is cured and she goes out into the garden and for the first time in her life she sees the beautiful redness of a red rose. Now the basic idea of the knowledge argument is that Mary learns something. She has acquired some new piece of knowledge about the world. And the simple conclusion from this is if that's right, then there are non-physical facts about the world. After all, she had all the physical knowledge before. She wasn't lacking any physical knowledge. And it wasn't physical knowledge that she acquired. So the argument here is that, she, that, that there are non-physical facts. Now, again, all of the topics that I'm discussing today are controversial and there's arguments for and against and we, we can discuss those, but this is another argument. And in general, several of the arguments, such as the knowledge argument, the explanatory gap, again, David Chalmers champions these arguments and says what's going on in these cases is that we have what he calls an epistemic gap between the physical and the mental. In the case of the explanatory gap, we can't explain the mental in terms of the physical. In case of the knowledge argument, then we can have knowledge of the physical, but that doesn't give us knowledge of the, the mental, that conscious experience of seeing red. He then argues that if there's an epistemic gap, there's an ontological gap. If there's a gap in our knowledge about the world, then that strongly suggests there's a gap in the way the world is, ontologically, how things really are in the world. And if that's right, then physicalism is false. Now, in one of the papers I presented of Chalmers um, uh, as sort of background material, um, he looks at various ways in which people have tried to object to this argument. Um, uh, and so he defends this, and therefore, if he's right about this, physicalism is false. There's a non-physical aspect to reality. So this is my conclusion too. I've looked at this difference between physical and mental in terms of their properties. They certainly appear to be fundamentally different aspects to the world we live in. We've looked at the explanatory gap. I've briefly looked at the knowledge argument as a couple of arguments that point in this direction. Well, uh, drawing to a, con to a close now, um, I want to say just a little bit more about how this might relate to a Christian worldview. So what is a human being? So here is the story so far. Um, we aren't robots. And we aren't purely physical beings. And actually from some of these thoughts about being angry with a robot, 
or about that feeling that you have when you want that sandwich for lunch, actually these give us insights into the nature of, of reality, the nature of, of what it is to be human. Of course, not a full picture as to what it means to be human, but the idea that we are not just robots and there's something more than the physical. And as I say, what I find fascinating is that we have atheists who would agree with me on both of these points. Now the question is, where does this sit with regard to worldviews? Do these findings sit better with an atheistic or naturalistic worldview on the one hand, or a theistic worldview on the other? And so what we might do is consider these two worldviews in terms of naturalism or atheism on the left hand side, where everything is, at least the typical view, would be that everything is ultimately physical or material. Matter is what's fundamental, and everything else derives from that, including the human mind. Or alternatively, we might think of theism, where there's an intelligent mind behind the universe, and it's mind that is fundamental, and everything else has been produced by that intelligent creator of the universe. Now, of course, there are other worldviews as well, but um, these will suffice for our purposes at the moment. Now, which of these worldviews do our findings fit with better? If there's a non-physical dimension to reality, I would suggest that that fits much better with the right-hand side of the screen here. Because it's very difficult to see where this non-physical dimension plausibly fits into the left side of the screen, into the naturalistic worldview. Now, as I say, there are some atheists who do think there's a non-physical dimension. And so now they're adjusting, if you like, what is fundamental. That it's not just matter, they're sort of building the mental or something like the mental in as part of fundamental reality. But that's a huge shift, and I think it's one that sits much more naturally with a theistic worldview. So that's one thing that I think is worth bearing in mind from a, a, a Christian worldview perspective. But let me then just in conclusion look very briefly at a few things that I think the Bible has to say about what it means to be made in the image of God. And we've already heard more about this this morning. And I would sum up uh, at least a few of the, the main biblical points about this as follows. First of all, that humans are unique. No other creature is said to be made in God's image. Secondly, this applies to all human beings everywhere. In Genesis, the emphasis is on this image applying to male and female. Thirdly, it's something that is not lost due to the fall. And we see this later in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 9, for example, um, where it also provides the foundation for the value of human beings. That's where our value comes from in terms of being made in God's image. It's what is unique about us. Well, there's much more we could say about that, but for the sake of time, I, I will move on. Three views that theologians have, have looked at. Jeremy has already discussed these earlier this morning, so uh, I'm not going to discuss them now. Suffice to say that I agree with them. I don't think we have to make a choice between these. I, I think all of these can, can be embraced as, as giving us a, a perspective on what it means to be a human being made in the image of God. And... Uh, by way of interest, there's a, a book by Noreen Hertzfeld that looks at um, artificial intelligence and how it relates to the image of God. In our image, it's called. And there she looks at these three different views and very interestingly look, looks at how those might relate to various developments that have taken place within AI, different approaches that have been um, uh, adopted within AI. Now, the point I want to make about this is that when we look at this idea of humans being made in the image of God, well, I don't want to pin down exactly what this amounts to, but it seems to me that conscious experience would be an important aspect of this. We are not just physical machines. I think there's something more to who we are in the biblical account, something beyond the physical, and our conscious experience is is, is something that is, is clearly part of who we are. Um, and this could be one aspect of, of human nature. Um, or at least something that is required 
by us being made in the image of God. So moral responsibility, let's take that second view. Uh, if we're morally responsible agents, can we be morally responsible without being conscious? Well, again, it's hard to see how uh, a, a, a machine can really have moral responsibility. And thirdly, relationships. Again, a very fundamental aspect. And given my arguments about AI, that it will lack consciousness, then how can it really have <coughs> proper relationships? It would only be simulating relationships. So, actually, I think this idea of humans being unique because we're made in the image of God fits with what we've been looking at in this talk, that we're fundamentally different from computers and that there is a non-physical aspect to um, who we are. So, AI raises a lot of important questions. Uh, I have only addressed two of them, although I think they're quite significant ones. Others have been addressed earlier this morning as well. What I'm trying to argue then is that there will always be a fundamental difference between humans and AI. This is not just a matter of further developments in technology. There are fundamental reasons in principle for thinking that there will be this difference and that it will remain. And I think this fits in very well with the idea that humans are made in the image of God.